I understand that uh, Stephen Hurd is speaking about science uh, communication at 4 o'clock and that uh, our own guest speaker today uh, wants to make it to that, to, to that talk. So we'll, uh, we'll start a minute early. Uh, it is my pleasure to be able to welcome Lisa Stein uh, today. Uh, this actually, I don't think I made it to your job talk 11 years ago, and so this is probably going to be the very first opportunity I've had uh, to, uh, to actually listen to Lisa give a presentation. Uh, there is an upcoming, uh, well the last one before Christmas is December 13th, and I believe it's uh, Clement. Uh, Clement is not here at the moment, that's all right. Uh, but uh, please try and uh, pencil that into your calendars as well. And uh, without further ado, and, I, and I'm not going to lie, your, your gift is unwrapped here at the front. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll present that now so that you can oh, run before thanks. Stephen starts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yours. It's such a pleasure to be invited to give one of these chairs lectures because probably many of you haven't seen what I've been up to since uh, I came in 2008. And at that time, my talk was on nitrogen physiology. So I've migrated from the nitrogen world into the methane world, although in my life, those are kind of two sides of the same coin because the microbes are very similar. So um, one of the other things that happened is that um, there's been some uh, new faculty recruitments in other departments at the university, and one of those newer faculty, I guess 2011, I don't know how new that is, um, Dominic Savageau was recruited into chemical and materials engineering, and he has expertise in optimizing processes for industry. And he's microbe agnostic. He doesn't really care what processes he's optimizing, but I was able to capture his excitement with conversion of single carbon substrates into products of interest. And so the work I'm presenting today is truly a joint collaboration. All of our students are co-supervised on this project. All of the funding except for our individual NSERT grants is held in joint. And so we really are a team between two different faculties. So methane, it's more than a gas because it's also a problem and hopefully a solution is uh, being provided by our labs. So the problem that all of you are already familiar with is that methane is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, the numbers have changed a little bit, but I always say it's about 23 times more powerful uh, than CO2 on a molecule-to-molecule -molecule basis in terms of holding in heat. And just like the other greenhouse gases since the, um, actually if you projected this through the early 18, or the late 1800s, it follows the other uh, hockey stick diagrams where um, from the Industrial Revolution on, it's been increasing in the atmosphere. And so we have point sources like you see with that factory picture, uh, but I really like this figure. This is from the Environmental Protection Agency in, in the US. And so what this diagram is showing is the methane sources. So green and blue here are what they call natural sources, although these ones, uh, many of these in blue are perturbed by anthropogenic activities. And then these two in brown are purely uh, human cause. So this is fossil fuel burning and biomass burning. Now if you compare that to methane sinks, there's far fewer sinks for methane. So 85% of this is tropospheric uh, destruction, 5% is atmospheric destruction, and then this little 10% bar, this is biological oxidation. So we don't have a lot of sinks to play with for methane. So a lot of the talk about methane mitigation has focused on how do we change our behaviors, but as a biologist we do have a biological solution as well. Now this is a slide that Dominic likes to show in his talks because we are in Canada, which is a region with a lot of permafrost environments, and uh, Suzanne and Vince will probably appreciate this because you guys are very much aware of these ecosystems. And there's a massive amount of methane that's held in these frozen permafrost environments, mostly in the form of methane clathrates. And so there's a concern that as global warming and climate change start um, getting more rapid and uh, start causing massive melt of this permafrost, one of the outcomes of that is a release of methane from these ecosystems. And as you saw, there's not a whole lot of mitigation in terms of what can be a sink for methane, and so there's a concern with these massive methane sources. So what can we do with methane? 
Well, this is one of those lovely cartoons of the methane cycle, so you see a lot of human stuff on the top here. But what you see in the soil are two major processes. So this one here, methanogenesis, so that's the generation of methane by archaeal microbes. And then you see just a couple of circles here, which is the sink, the biological sink for methane. So these are the methanotrophs. So methanotrophy means the microbes that eat methane. And um, those are the organisms that we study and that we're trying to adapt to an industrial platform. So our solution is methanotrophs. And methanotrophs are really interesting microorganisms. Um, they're really beautiful to look at under the microscope. They're also odorless, which I really appreciate as a microbiologist. Uh, one of the things that are features that's fun about them is that they have these layers of intracytoplasmic membranes. And those membranes are there because methane oxidation isn't that energetically favorable. They do grow okay. They have a doubling time anywhere between three and a half to 10 hours which compared to E. coli, that E. coli has a doubling time of about 20 minutes. So these are um, a bit more challenged energetically. And so um, one of the strategies that the microbes have evolved is to create these layers of membrane and they pack the enzymes into those membranes so that they have more surface area to oxidize methane and create energy for the cell. So this is the C1 pathway that we make use of. So methane is oxidized to methanol by a very interesting enzyme called methane monooxygenase. And methane monooxygenases require molecular oxygen. And this is the only enzyme, well, there's two. There's an anaerobic methane oxidation pathway too. But for aerobic methanotrophs, this is the only enzyme that we know of that can activate methane. Methane is extremely stable. So for biology to be able to activate it, it has to get oxygen into this structure. So to do that, it actually requires energy, and that energy comes from this methanol oxidation step. And so these two steps are intrinsically interlinked. Now these uh, microbes can grow on methanol too as a substrate. They're not quite as well adapted, but they can use methanol, and you'll see some of that in uh, parts of the talk today. So methanol is oxidized to formaldehyde. Many of you know formaldehyde because that's the pickling juice that you get your dissecting animals in. That's the preservative that we often use in biology. Um, these microbes don't pickle themselves, and they actually have a really interesting way. I'm not going to talk about it today. But they have a really interesting way of avoiding the toxicity of formaldehyde. So there's been a lot of work done with that about how can a microbe survive using formaldehyde as their main carbon source for assimilation. So a lot of our work is talking about we're trying to figure out how to gate formaldehyde into biomass because the way that these microbes assimilate carbon is through this formaldehyde step. So you'll see some of that formaldehyde movement into other molecules. And then for making energy, if they're not assimilating formaldehyde, they'll oxidize this molecule to formate and then to CO2. So that's the methane oxidation pathway. Now what we're trying to do is we're taking methane and we're doing a four-step process, and I'll take you through some little highlights of each of these. So we're culturing methanotrophs. We're looking at intracellular metabolism using advanced genomic techniques. Uh, this is much in Dominic's corner, the processing side, because that's the engineering part. So how do we maximize their growth to make product? And then finally, we're trying to capture products. And the two uh, products that we're focusing on right now are bioplastics, or polyhydroxybutyrate, and jet fuel. And we're focus focusing on isoprenoid-based jet fuels. So going from methane to those products. So I'll tell you about these individually. We'll, t we'll start with culturing. So the first thing about culturing is that we have to know what we're growing. And, um, when Dominic and I started this work, I was very much on the microbial diversity, metabolism, physiology side, and I have this collection of methanotrophs in my lab. And from 2008 to 2017, I, ha I was one of the founders, I, I guess I was the key founder because I was the one that convinced everybody to do it, um, but we uh, founded this group called the Organization for Methanotroph Genome Analysis, and over the years we were able to convince 16 investigators from eight different countries to submit their cultures for genome analysis. And then um, I and a few of my colleagues got the funding through the U.S. Department of Energy um, to get them sequenced, and then together we collaboratively annotated these genome sequences, and we uh, did 25 genomes through this Omega group, and we published 11 papers during that time. 
Now, this was an extremely successful collaboration and one of my um, one of the, my favorite things I've ever done in science because it was really a community effort and truly grassroots. And since this time, there's been over 200 genomes uh, sequenced from methanotrophs. So we really did start a, a nice revolution in microbiology. So um, we have then in my lab several of those genome sequence strains. So the next thing, and this was my bread and butter for a long time, is to determine the metabolic potential of each one of those strains. So some of the things that we did over the years is that in my lab we discovered that these microbes don't just breathe oxygen, they can actually breathe nitrate as well. And this is important because there is a lot of um, metagenomic information and environmental information coming out that in, an, in anoxic ecosystems, these aerobic methanotrophs were abundant, but there was no oxygen, so how could they be there? So in that period of time in the literature, they talked about how these microbes must have filtered down from the oxic region, or maybe they were transient waiting for oxygen. And so what we found out is that indeed they can actively respire nitrogen oxides. The, another group also found at the same time that they can ferment. So they're not necessarily fermenting methane. What they're doing is oxidizing methane to formaldehyde with the very little oxygen they can scavenge. Even in anoxic environments, there's enough oxygen for them to scavenge. There's no, truly, there's no true anoxia in an environment where there's plenty of nitrate. So these microbes use that small amount of oxygen to oxidize methane to formaldehyde, and then they ferment formaldehyde. And that was a neat discovery. So these are hypoxic metabolisms. And then other things that we've been doing is looking at each one of our strains and determining how they respond differently to different culturing conditions. So they grow in methane or methanol. Some like nitrate better than ammonium. Some like different types of metals. And so we've done a lot of physiological experiments to look at the variability of their physiology. And then we also looked at strains that can make useful products under different conditions. So we had a student that was looking at that uh, bioplastic production, and what he did is he did a combination, several growth experiments, looking at combinations of methane and methanol, looking at carbon to nitrogen ratios and changing ammonium or nitrate, and then doing this, um, I'll show this to you a little bit later, but um, this is a curve showing the peak at where we have the, the ultimate combination of those nutrients that lead to the best bioplastic yield. That's extremely important for our industrialization um, goals. So this is information from Dimitri Kitts. Some of you might remember him. He was a student in my lab for eight years, from undergrad to grad, so not just totally a graduate student. But he started when I started, so um, longtime student. Um, so uh, what he did is he was the one who discovered this respiration of nitrogen oxides by methanotrophs. And this is a figure from his thesis where he looked at all of the genomes that we had available at the time that had some of the genes that are involved in the denitrification pathway. So what these microbes do is they use methane as their energy source and they use the nitrogen oxides as their terminal electron acceptor. So that's their respiratory pathway. Now this is the full pathway, and you can see there's three sets of genes here. And then what you see in this figure is the list of genomes. And then these gray bars are the organisms that have the entire pathway where they can reduce nitrate to nitrous oxide. So this was sort of a, a good news, bad news thing. It was a, it's a really cool physiology. But what these microbes are doing is they're consuming a pretty bad greenhouse gas and making a much worse one. <laughs> So they really do stop at nitrous oxide. They don't go to N2 because nitrous oxide is not toxic to them. And then in terms of fermentation, um, even though Dimitri didn't discover the fermentation pathway, he did look at the diversity of fermenters in methanotrophs. So this is just showing three different methanotrophs. These numbers are the strains. So we have a strain FJG1, which was his major strain, and then 5GB1 and 20Z are two other strains of methanotroph. So in red, he was able to demonstrate that this FJG1 strain could make fumarate, succinate, and acetate through fermenting formaldehyde. And then this uh, 5GB1 strain makes formate and acetate. And the 20Z strain makes lactate, lactate, succinate, and acetate. Why is this important? Because molecules like lactate, this is another bioplastic. And there's been some papers coming out recently showing how we can optimize fermentation of this 20Z strain 
to make lactate as a bioproduct. So fermentation products have always been important in microbiology. It's just that we usually use sugar as the feedstock, which is expensive. So in this case, we're using methane as the feedstock, which is a greenhouse gas and a waste product from industry. So it's a pretty cool development. And then the other thing that we're doing with our strains is really trying to figure out how they grow in an optimal way in terms of nutrient combinations. So this is from the paper that the department posted um, in combination with this talk. This is a new paper from Catherine Tays in Frontiers in Microbiology. It's a monster of a paper because what she did is she looked at five strains of methanotrophs. So this is strains one through five. She grew them all in methane or methanol with nitrate or ammonium and looked at their growth rates and growth yields, plus looked at their metabolites, their genome expression. It just, it's a monster of a paper. So this is one figure from that paper. And what you see is that these circles are the optimal conditions under which these various strains could grow. So again, when we're talking about choosing, selecting a strain that we want to industrialize, this is extremely useful information because this strain here grew best with methanol and not methane. So maybe this strain is better for forestry effluents that have methanol as a carbon source, whereas a strain like let's choose like this one that, that grows on very low methane and nitrate, that might be good for a wastewater treatment plant effluent. So we can look at how they grow and then match the microbe to the waste stream that we're trying to use as a feedstock. And then the last piece for um, what we're doing for uh, looking at cultures and their response, this is back to that figure that I showed you in the beginning. We're trying to figure out the optimal combination of nutrients to get to products of interest. So this is work from uh, Jorge uh, Zaldivar Carrillo, who was our first master's student in our project. And um, he's trained in engineering, so this is a new uh, type of statistical analysis for me. And it's called response surface methodology. It's a pretty powerful tool. And so what you're seeing are these uh, response um, spaces that are mapping where we get the most PHB based on different nutrient combinations. So by doing a very large number of experiments, growth experiments, he was able to demonstrate that we got the best bioplastic production with this particular strain with a 30% methane, 70% methanol mixture with nitrate as the nitrogen source and with a nitrogen to carbon ratio of 0.017. Now this will be different for every strain. So we have to determine empirically for each strain and each product what type of response surface they'll have. So you can see how much work is generated. So each one, each product, each microbe has to go through an analysis like this. All right, so that's the culturing part. So let's talk a little bit about the intracellular mapping. And this is my favorite because I'm a molecular biologist and I get very excited about gene expression. So this is the, the part that I'm enjoying a lot right now. So um, one of the main things we want to do is create genetic systems for methanotrophs. Now E. coli has had a genetic system for a long time. There's mutants in every gene. Well, maybe not all the hypotheticals, but we have mutant libraries for E. coli. That's not the case with environmental microbes. You have to create genetic systems from scratch, and it can be really, really time consuming and difficult. So we're, we decided to do it. And um, <laughs> the reason is that we want to get unnatural products in addition to natural products. So these methanotrophs naturally make bioplastics, but they don't naturally make isoprenoid jet fuels. <laughs> and so to make them make isoprenoid jet fuels, what we have to do is understand their carbon metabolism, and we need genetic systems to knock out pathways that will compete so carbon storage pathways that will compete with funneling that formaldehyde into isoprenoids. And then we need to add genes that bring us to isoprenoids of the proper carbon content. So our strains can make isoprenoids of C5 carbons, but we want to get to C15 or C10 carbons at the end. So that's our challenge. And then we want to you know, grow these maximally to get that carbon funnel to where we want. And then at the same time, in order to get our genes expressed appropriately, we need to understand how to induce expression of those genes. 
And so we have other students that are looking at <coughs> promoters, natural promoters from methanotrophs, but also promoters from other systems, even phage genomes, that could possibly work so that we can provide the microbe with that signal and have them express our genes of interest at will. So things like temperature-induced promoters will allow us to shift the growth temperature of our microbe by a few degrees and then it will turn that gene expression on and we can instigate the production of isoprene. So those are two things we're doing with molecular chassis. We call it molecular chassis development because it's a, a platform for expressing whatever genes we want. And then this is where I'm super excited, and this is the topic of my new NSERC proposal. So some of you know I always smile when I'm writing my NSERC because, you know, coming from the American system, <laughs> I find NSERC to be so fun to write. It's so much more fun than an NSF proposal. And um, I had a really good time uh, writing it about these genome scale metabolic models. So to me, this is really the next phase of post-genomic research. And it can be applied to any biological system where you have a genome sequence. So the way that we're using it is that we have well-curated genomes for our methanotrophic bacteria. And so with all of those experiments that these students are doing, if you ever come to my lab, what you'll see is just, uh, some of you have been, bench after bench of little tiny bottles with screw cap tops that have a butyl rubber stopper we can put methane into it. And it's just rows and rows and rows of these cultures. So in each one of those cultures we can extract messenger RNA and look at the transcriptome of those microbes. We can extract all the proteins and do the proteome of those microbes and hopefully Glenn will get that system going and we can make use of the proteome facility. Uh, we can also look at metabolome, the metabolome of the microbes. And so metabolites are extremely informative because that really shows us where the carbon is being gated in these organisms. So if we do this thousands and thousands of times under thousands and thousands of conditions, we can layer all of that information onto the genome sequence. So the genome sequence is a map. It shows us all the potential that a microbe has for performing different reactions. And so if we map whether this gene is expressed under this condition or this protein is made under that condition, what we end up with is something that looks like this. So this, is a, this isn't a genome scale metabolic model in its entirety. This is only two conditions for one microbe. So this is, again, work from Dimitri Kitt's thesis. And what he did is he was looking at which proteins or which pathways are induced under anoxia versus oxic growth. And his question was whether these microbes are only denitrifying or do they denitrify and ferment simultaneously. And so he had a system where he uh, grew them under oxic conditions, extracted the messenger RNA and sequenced it, extracted the proteins and sequenced them, and then extracted the metabolites and found out what they were. And all that information was scaffolded onto the genome sequence, and that's what you're seeing here. So the purple are things that are induced under anoxia. The yellow are things that are suppressed under anoxia. And he was able to show pretty clearly that denitrification at the top there and fermentation are equally expressed under anoxia. So this is a microbe that's doing simultaneous denitrification and fermentation. But what was really interesting is that they're still using oxygen. So this is in the, the we can't measure oxygen in the anoxic, uh, in that sample. So to us, it's completely anoxic. But of course, there is, you know, enough oxygen that they have these uh, molecules that can scavenge trace amounts of oxygen, bring it to the methane monooxygenase, get that methane activated and oxidized to the level of formaldehyde, <coughs> and then what's happening is that the formaldehyde is being gated into these fermentation pathways. And so this was pretty exciting for us to see because it validated um, that this microbe does have a very rich metabolism and we can make use of this in industry. So we can selectively turn off oxygen and get fermentation products when we're ready for them. And then what was suppressed was also fun because it validated that, met that formaldehyde oxidation was slowed down, which is good because we don't want formaldehyde to be oxidized all the way to CO2. We want formaldehyde to be processed through the fermentation pathway. And so that's what the microbe is doing. 
Now, the trade-off here is that we also see a slowdown in assimilatory pathways. So that means the microbe is growing at a painfully slow rate. We can grow it in continuous culture under these conditions, but it's going from a, a, a doubling time of about four hours to a doubling time of over 24 hours. So that's the trade-off. Now, in an industrial context, we can deal with that because we can grow them under aerobic conditions and then shut off the oxygen to get our products. So we can, we can handle that in an industrial setting. All right, so that's my, the, the genome scale metabolic modeling is my favorite thing. Um, the next step is processing, and a lot of this um, is, again, under Dominic's guidance. Um, this is one that I do have some uh, interest in, and I have some say in, in what's happening physiologically, because one of the things that we looked at when we got our funding for this methane bioconversions project is that the uh, industries that are interested in partnering with us are wastewater, so the, the gold bar facility, um, or forestry. And there's a forestry plant somewhere out, like going towards Jasper that, <laughs> yeah, out there in Alberta. Um, so <laughs> and actually Nate uses that same effluent to make um, dimethyl ether fuels. So Nate has a very large project converting that forestry waste. They use the methanol and convert the methanol to dimethyl ether, which is a gaseous fuel that they're using for, you know, this new um, biomass conversions enterprise. So we can use that same waste product, but it's extremely acidic. And our microbes have an optimal growth pH of 6.8. And so we had a student determine whether we could adapt our strains to low pH. And so these two lines here, this is um, showing strains growing that are unadapted at 6.8. So the gray line is an unadapted strain. And then the unadapted strain at pH 4.2 or 4.24 doesn't grow at all. But our adapted strain will grow at both pH 6.8 and at pH 4.24. And now we have it growing at 3.9. I think, you know, physiologically and chemically, because I think I know how they pH adapt, I told them the cutoff would be 3.8, and so far I'm right about that. So um, we do have them growing at pH 3.9, and that's probably as good as we'll get. But the forestry effluent is around, you know, between pH 4.2 to 4.5. So I think we're in a good window to use that effluent. And then another challenge we have is when we're scaling up from lab scale, so like 1 to 10 liters on the bench, up to 1,000 liters in industry, we have to worry about how we're going to feed these microbes. And so another group of students is looking at uh, fed batch laws. So how do we pulse feed our feedstock, whether it's methane or methanol or a combination, how can we scale that? And so this is an experiment, this is done in a five liter bioreactor, and what she found is that if she feeds this microbe with methanol only, then they tend to reach stationary phase, and even if we pulse methanol in, there's something limiting their growth. If she adds copper as well, we can get a little bit better growth, but there's still something limiting. And so what she's trying to do is figure out how to overcome this limitation so that when we get out into the field and we're growing this at scale, we know what's going to limit their growth and we can overcome that to get maximal production. And that's, that's something that has to happen in any bioconversion process. You have to be able to maximize and scale up. So in terms of ways that we're approaching fermentation, this is uh, Dominic's claim to fame and he wants to apply this uh, operation to methane bioconversions. This is a, um, a novel way to perform chemostat growth and it's scalable. So this works at one liter and it should work the same at a thousand liters. So this is called self-cycling fermentation. And the reason that this is, I'll explain it in a moment, but the reason that we're um, pursuing self-cycling fermentation is that if we perform our fermenters using this process, the cells will start dividing simultaneously. And so we can have synchronized cell division. Now, the reason that's advantageous is because it's been shown with every organism so far, whether it's yeast or E. coli or any microbe, when they undergo this synchronization, their production of bioproduct is maximized in a, 
in a large way. So for example, there's a student in David Bressler's lab who's doing self-cycling fermentation with ethanol producing yeast. And just by going from normal fed batch to this type of fermentation strategy, she has increased ethanol production by 40%. And that's a major improvement for bioethanol. And so there's companies in Alberta that make bioethanol that are now employing self, or they're, they're trying to get to the point where they can employ self-cycling fermentation because it's free money. It's essentially taking all of their same feedstocks and processes and getting more out of it. So the, the principle here, it's very simple. We don't understand why it works. <laughs> uh, so we have students trying to figure out the molecular underpinnings of that. So the principle is that you grow a batch culture. Once it reaches stationary phase, we usually monitor that by carbon dioxide evolution. So when CO2 levels out, then we remove half of the media and we fill it back up with fresh media and we let it grow again. And that's considered a cycle. So after about three cycles, the cells will start dividing at the same time. So a student is actually um, doing the transcriptome and proteome with yeast and E. coli that are doing just normal batch growth versus self-cycling fermentation to figure out what's happening physiologically that makes them synchronize. So that's exciting on its own, just biologically. Like, why do they do it? So the problem with methanotrophs is that they use methane as a carbon source. We can't limit them for methane to make them go into stationary phase because we have problems with mass transfer of methane. And so it's an unreliable indicator of stationary phase. So our strategy is to use nitrogen limitation and that will be the way they, they run out of a key nutrient, achieve stationary phase, and end each cycle. So it's a, a little tweak on a, another method. All right, so that's um, the processing side. So the last piece is the product recovery, and we have a couple of new strategies for this. And John will like this because you like phage. <clears throat> so um, the problem with these methanotrophs, I mean, it's beautiful that they have all those membranes. They're great, but they're super difficult to break open. And that makes it difficult even to do transcriptomics and proteomics because you have to use some pretty powerful solvents to break the cells. In industrial bioconversions, they have to use chloroform because that's the least expensive and most efficient way to break the cells. Chloroform, as you know, is super toxic. It's not a green chemical. Some, most of it can be recovered and recycled, but there's still chloroform going into the waste stream. And that pretty much negates the greenness of our new technology. And so I think to sell this technology, we need more environmentally sound ways to extract our products and the bioplastic is in intracellular granules. So phage is a really nice way to do this. So bacteriophage are viruses that will infect specific bacterial cells and break them open. So we don't know any phage that infect methanotrophs. It has not been studied before. And that means that we've put graduate students on the project and they're doing, it's a two-phase project. So they're looking for native phage from uh, oil sand samples and um, sludge from the uh, Gold Bar wastewater treatment plant. But the other thing that she's doing is she's looking for prophage. Now prophage are um, bacteriophage that have sequestered themselves inside the chromosome of the microbe. And sometimes prophage can be encouraged or induced to break out, make viral particles, and lice open the cell. And you can actually industrialize prophage to become um, lytic agents at will. It takes a bit of doing, but it's possible. So what you're seeing here are three different methanotrophs. These are different computer programs that have looked through the genomes of these organisms and have decided where the prophage regions are. And then what the student is doing is she's adding a chemical that induces prophage lysis, and then she'll sequence those phage and see which of these regions was the one that created a viral particle. So that's a, a fun new project. And then on the chemical engineering side, um, we're also trying to use switchable solvents. Switchable solvents are a unique type of solvent. They're um, completely recoverable and recyclable, less harmful environmentally than chloroform. And they have this really cool property where they go through a um, hydrophobic state. But then if you add carbon dioxide, they uh, become hydrophilic. 
And then if you take out the CO2, they can go back to being hydrophobic. So how are we using this to extract bioplastics? Well, we take our polymer or our cells, we add our solvent, that solvent will lyse the cells. We've already demonstrated that it can break the cells open. Then uh, we have a uh, hydrophobic <coughs> polymer in solution. We add CO2, the uh, solution, the um, solvent will become hydrophilic, and what happens is the polymer will aggregate and we can collect it as a gel. So this has been pretty successful so far. It's working with PHB. We're testing it with isoprene. Um, it's, an, it's a new idea, so uh, we'll see how that goes. I don't have much say in this part because it's like true chemical engineering, <laughs> but you know, it's, a, it's a neat idea. All right, so then that's the march through the four realms of how we're approaching methane bioconversions. So just to sum up, what we're doing is we're trying to maximize the metabolic potential of genome sequenced with anatrophic strains that have been my lab pets for a number of years. And then we're looking at developing new processes, new recovery of our products, and then we've sold to funding agencies that we should be able to make isoprene jet fuels. But um, really the platform that's already underway and is already being marketed by some companies in the U.S. is the bioplastics from methane. And the, um, what's that natural uh, soap store? The, is it the Rocky Mountain Soap Company that's around? Yeah, so they've approached us to, they've challenged us to come up with a, bio, a truly biodegradable shampoo bottle. So that's our, our target, is to try to make this prototype for the Rocky Mountain Soap Company. And of course, there's a cast of, maybe not thousands, but there's a growing cast of students. Um, it's really uh, humbling, actually, to see the talent pool that we've been able to attract with the project between engineering and biological sciences. So it's been really fun to work with a much larger team than I ever thought that I would work with. So we have students in chemical and materials engineering. We have a number of bio students. And then our external collaborators, Mango Materials, they're, um, they already have commercial partners that are buying their PHB bioplastics to make fabric. So they have fabrics on the market that are made from methane-based bioplastics, and that's pretty exciting. And then the National Renewable Energy Lab at, um, in Golden, Colorado, they uh, also have a single carbon um, bioconversions platform. And so they help us with metabolomics. They have a number of industrial feedstocks so we can test whether they're toxic to our microbes or not. And we have a cross-training program so students can go to Colorado and learn all of their tools and play with their things. And it's been fun. And of course, the cast of characters for funding, a lot of this is Dominic's doing because he's one of those guys that loves to write grants. And I'm the one saying, no more grants. We have too many students. Um, but it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's been accepted quite um, extensively in Alberta, this idea of making a, a methane bioconversions platform. And fairly recently, we uh, are one of the six uh, science faculties in Alberta, or U of A Future Energy Systems. And that's been a very exciting um, and dynamic group to work with here at U of A. And that's my talk. So I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, I kept it. So, have you got a phone call from NASA yet? Because I reckon you've got suggestions about what they might look for when they start looking for life on Mars. And it goes all the way back to your early comment about don't need oxygen, but you can respire so-called on other things. I mean. I do work with NASA, so I did my postdoc at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab where I got this interest. And so my colleagues there, the problem with NASA is that I can't, I can't take money from them, which they like, <laughs> because I can work for free. Um, so what I've done is I've sent our cultures to my colleagues, and what they're doing that's actually pretty cool, what they're looking for is a, um, a combination of perchlorate reducing microbes that generate oxygen and then our methanotrophs can consume that as an oxygen source. But what we've seen, we did a little experiment with George Ochram's cyanobacteria under an anoxic environment and what the methanotrophs do is they'll colonize the outer uh, membrane of the cyanobacteria because they're just sucking up the oxygen as it's being produced.
So it's really a beautiful, and I'm sure that it's, that, that's how they work in nature. They're actually really, really abundant in um, the dead zones, the oxygen minimum zones, these microbes, because they have plenty of nitrate, and they're essentially sucking up any internally produced oxygen. But they're also the source of nitrous oxide. So they help them resolve a biogeochemical question, but in a way, like I said, it's a good news, bad news thing because they are a nitrous oxide source. Yeah. So the, the, the intermittent culture change thing is fascinating because you, you're going to stationary phase, but it looks like the biomass production is still exponential. Is that, I mean, that's what the graph showed. Is that what was really happening? Which one was that? Uh, the Oops. process slide you had. So the, you mean the, um, this guy? Yeah. Yeah, so what's happening here is that before we get that line, mm -hmm. there's a computer, so we tell it when, these are automated, well, we hope to get them on, they're, right now they're student automated. <laughs> 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 but the dream is to have a computer say, this is stationary phase. <laughs> so what this is showing is that we know when the CO2, just from our ongoing studies of culturing these things for you know, on and on. We know when it, when the, when it reaches stationary, so it does, this is only exponential, and we drain it before it has an extended stationary so phase. you're refeeding them every mm -hmm. cell cycle. Yep. Basically. And then we extend that log phase. So, I mean, that, that's, that's the way you, synchro you can synchronize animal cells. Oh, okay, so it works. Serum starvation, feeding mm -hmm. serum starvation, and, and you end up collecting everything, because everything stops at one phase, and then you give it the, what it needs, and it, it continues on. So. That would be, you know, a, a, a simple, non-complex explanation for why you're getting synchrony. Although it doesn't tell you why synchrony would give you such an increase in biomass. The other thing that it does, and, and what Dominic studied as a graduate student, is how synchrony can synchronize phage lytic events. So he cultivates phage this way because he can maximize burst size by having them be in synchrony. And also, um, bacteria don't have the complex cell cycle of eukaryotes. And so it's, uh, you know, we're not exactly sure what's happening with their cell cycle because they're not Which defined that way. Do they random in the cell cycle when they hit stationary phase? Or do they go into a, a, you know, a stationary quiet state that then triggers out at, at, at the same part of the process of cell division? So stationary phase is induced by any number of starvation signals and then the way that they will change their, and Tracy probably knows this pretty well from E. coli, so um, whether you starve them for nitrogen or carbon or phosphorus or something else, um, there are standard markers for their stationary phase, but the physiology is a little bit different depending on how they're starving. And then there's also toxin production in a batch. So the toxins will compete with the stationary phase physiology and you can start getting die off. Yeah. And it depends on the microbe too, right? It totally depends on the microbe, some yeah. Of them make spores, some of them will mm -hmm. reduce viable but non-cultural yeah. state. Like Vibrio. Some of them will just wait for more nutrients to come mm -hmm. along and then start growing again. Some of them even make cysts, which isn't a spore, but it's a weird physiology that they... You're going to select for things that can double within a certain time frame given the stimulus of, of diluting them by 50. Exactly, and so one of the things that's happening as the students do all of these experiments, they're selecting for really robust growers and deselecting for the sluggish guys. And my students were concerned about that. They're like, oh no, they might be mutating, they're growing faster. And I said, oh, that's great. <laughs> Keep it, throw away the rest. <laughs> we want that. <laughs> uh, Ted and then Colleen. I'm imagining like differential proteomics, differential transcriptomics. If everything's in synchrony, you're going to get a signal out of that because things are in synchrony. So when they're not in synchrony, it's going to be a mishmash of cells. It's an average, right? Yeah. It's an average. So, so far, our genome scale metabolic mapping has been done on the average population where there is no synchrony. And so we're just looking at, yeah, just all of the cells that some of them might be new, some of them might be dead. I mean, who knows? So we do expect just by looking at synchronized cells, it will change the way that we look at our proteome and our transcriptome data. I expect it to be quite different. But what we can do is apply what we know about maximal feeding towards product 
And so by changing the nutrients that are available during those cycles, we should be able to gate carbon where we want. But it's going to be tricky. It's not going to be like straightforward immediately. Yeah. Maybe we'll get lucky with some of the microbes. Some of them can be really stubborn critters. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not going to be a simple process. Yeah, Colleen. <laughs> it's not hidden to everybody. I just haven't been out there. <laughs> Somewhere out there. I don't know. Warehouse or whatever it is. But when you referred to them adapting to the lower pH, did you mean only exclusively genetic evolution and selecting them, or do you also mean kind of habituation, physiological habituation, and could the same? occur for this sort of boom and bust style of reproduction that yeah. generates synchronicity? Well, I, I love your question because Dominic and I have an ongoing debate about whether there's a genetic change and a selection for a mutator population or, you know, something that takes over that has a, a distinct genetic alteration versus just a physiological adaptation. I favor physiological adaptation. He favors genetic change. So the only way to resolve it is that we're forcing the student to genome sequence the adapted and not adapted. But it's possible, either scenario is possible in both the adaptation to pH and in this, this synchronized culture. Or, or even maybe more intriguingly, perhaps it's both, that you're selecting for the strains or variants with the most sort of flexibility. It's possible. I think that they already have that capacity built in, just from what I know about pH adaptation from other systems. I mean, Dominic might be right at the end, and then I'll have to buy him a drink or something. But um, the problem with, in my mind, the problem with relying on a genetic variant is that we, when we then scale up, what happens to genetic variants? then, like they're going to likely mutate again when they go from a bench scale, like 10 liters to 1,000 liters. They might still make our product, but I, I don't know. That Julia Fote had taught me industrial microbiology, and she always talked about these um, metabolic cripples that can form when you're doing industrial industrialization of any microbe. So uh, it's always in the back of my mind, like at some point, like on the bench scale, these variants might be extremely adaptive. But when you bring them to a scale up, they might just collapse. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I, I'm hoping there's physiological potential and it's not related just to a genetic mm -hmm. change. Yeah. With respect to that last question, when you were talking about your molecular chassis and doing this with your own two hands, making mm -hmm. movements to make the most, the maximal production isoprenine, preen. Mm -hmm. um, why won't you, why don't you just select your mutants that can produce the most ISO? Well, we'll do that too. So th it's not like a single stage and then we're done type of thing. So in order to get to the C15 to C20 uh, fuels that are drop-in fuels for jets. So that's at the point where they don't have to do any manipulation to have them work. And that's what's attractive right now because it's, you know, it's inexpensive and they can see a path towards commercialization. So um, we'll get them to the point of making those, but then we will adapt them. And that could involve these mutator or these strains that at least in our hands are doing very well. And then we'll see how they do with scale up. But it'll be both. We have to get the pathway involved and then we do have to adapt them again. So like start see, from scratch and readapt them. Natural isolates that overproduce those products? No, not for yeah. isoprenoids. No. No, in fact, that's a really tough project. I'm, I, I shouldn't say I'm surprised we got the funding because it's a good idea. It's just, it's hard to do in the real world because um, there's indication from old literature. Do any of you remember Roger Knowles when he's a Canadian microbiologist who was in um, my field from years ago? And he has the only paper out showing toxicity of isoprenoids to methanotrophs. So there's a possibility that some of our targets will be toxic. So part of that student's project is to do a toxicity screen with our targets and make sure it's not going to pickle itself. But if you selected for that, if you had environments with mm -hmm. high isoprenoids, then anything that grew... It would, would be already adapted. It'd have to have high methane too, uh, and those environments are 
Maybe we could identify one. I could start looking in the literature to see if there is a... Yeah, see, there are, um, you know, plants make isoprenes and there's a lot of isoprenoid production in the ocean, so it's possible we could find a methane-enriched, isoprene-enriched ecosystem. Yeah? Is there an avenue for genome editing in this instead of selection screens? Yes, and so that's what NREL is really good at, and so um, they are at the forefront of genome editing right now, and so the student who's making the chassis is going to spend the summer down there and um, look at doing those sorts of adaptations for our, or those manipulations for our strains. That's a, yeah, something that's on the horizon. There's some very promising results with other strains, and so we're hoping to adapt it to our strain. Yeah. So normally they would stick these products into cytoplasmic kind of vacuoles or vesicles, and that must limit their growth eventually. Mm -hmm. Once they, is that the limiting factor? Well, what's really interesting, so usually, so you're talking about the bioplastics. Yeah. So what's fun about PHB is that most microbes, and in the literature they say that microbes make bioplastics when they have too much carbon and they're starved of nitrogen. In fact, you have to scrub the media of nitrogen for them to even make PHB. Well, one of our strains is agnostic to how much nitrogen is present and it makes PHB throughout its whole life cycle. We don't know why. It doesn't make sense. Why would it make a storage compound when it has plenty of nitrogen? And so that's why you have to use chloroform because it's, they just put them all into vacuoles. In the yeah, so, they, so no matter what, they have to, they, they enclose, so this, it's a lipid-based yeah polymer and so um, yeah they have to enclose it so that this the whatever's happening the cytoplasm isn't impeded yeah and so I, I'm gonna channel Mario a little bit here, so <laughs> forgive me but <laughs> do they make vesicles do they they them? do and we've seen them and they're beautiful yes oh. they make really cool vesicles and yeah, I want I need a new student to study them no but I think we can get it in them and so that's so that's a new thing we saw with microscopy that Philip Sun has been doing with Arlene and um, they actually make quite a lot. Yeah. So I'm super excited about getting another student on that yeah. one. I can only grow the lab so much, but it's a really exciting thing when we saw that. It's like, oh my gosh, that's like a, a Mario thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. So do they, the genomes have methane you mean do DNA methylation? Like, yeah, do they do that as microbes? Right? They do. Yes, they do. So there is an epigenetic piece. Your plasticity question of plasticity versus genome evolution mm -hmm. isn't that simple, right? Like maybe she might have to go farther or your next student? So I have a PhD student who's doing um, the response surface methodology. He's taking that over, but he wrote his NSERC proposal on epigenetics and looking at methylation. I'm like, oh man, it's a whole other level. But you know, students can do that. They have that ability. But it's uh, that's going to open up a huge can of worms. Yeah, it will for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's completely unknown. I think it will be, and that's why it worries me because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to send us down an important, but you know. Yeah, exactly. And you can already see it's kind of a big program. Yes, yes. I'll be retired before all these things. <laughs> it's great. It is. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What fun questions. You guys are awesome. Are we good? You got nine minutes. Nine minutes? <laughs> I'm chasing Colleen. Yeah. I have one more question, then, if you've got the time. Mm -hmm. So I noticed when you were showing the, 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 the slide from the massive paper, one of the feedstocks was ammonia and an oxidized carbon. Yes. So in that case, you reversed the redox. Cycle. Mm -hmm. You're actually using, you're actually oxidizing the ammonia. Oh. With, a, with an oxygen-containing carbon. So that's a really good point. So you know, I come from the ammonia oxidation world, and that's the realm where I've. I'm actually more, I'm better known in ammonia oxidation than methane oxidation. This is fairly like, newer for me. Methanotropes are ammonia oxidizers, but they don't grow from oxidizing ammonia. What was interesting about that finding is that there are some methanotrophs that are poor ammonia oxidizers, but we don't know why because their methane monooxygenase is identical. And they don't oxidize hydroxylamine either, which is the product of ammonia oxidation. But ammonia can still inhibit methane monooxygenase because it's a competitive inhibitor with methane. 
So yeah, having ammonia as a nitrogen source, it's a wonderful nitrogen source because it's already reduced and so they can just put it into the assimilation pathway and they don't have to reduce nitrate to ammonia. But there's a competition with the MMO. So there's still some mysteries on how these microbes get around that inhibitory effect of ammonia. So, so the ammonia is being oxidized, what's oxidizing it? The methane monooxygenase. Where's it, where's it transferring the electrons to though? What's, what's, what's the so the monooxygenase requires electrons, so it's getting that reductant from methanol dehydrogenase. And then once it gets to hydroxylamine, and this is where it gets interesting, some methanotrophs have hydroxylamine dehydrogenase, which oxidizes hydroxylamine to nitrite or to nitric oxide. And then those electrons go somewhere, but they don't make it to the quinone pool. And there's no, there's no cytochromes that can get those electrons to the quinone pool, and that's why they're not ammonia oxidizers. So, so they just disappear? They, they disappear in some cytochrome pool, and they don't seem to benefit the organism. But there is a cytochrome C that's accepting those electrons. They don't just end up in space, right? Mm hmm It's fascinating. Yeah, that's a whole other part of the research. Right, because it's an enzyme, so... Exactly. receptors unknown, Mm-hmm. I spent a lot of years thinking about those things, and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go to industry. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's it. there's still mysteries in that whole um, monoox. Well, there's mysteries in terms of the ammonia oxidation pathway and how it that relates to the methane oxidation pathway because there's an evolutionary process that allowed those two lines of microbial metabolism to develop with similar enzymology. Yeah. I love those questions, though. Those are fun. Are we good? Can I run? Thank you. <laughs>